So I'm um, uh, an assistant professor here in the Department of Medicine for reasons that somewhat elude me. Um, I have a very fundamental interest in the viruses that infect bacteria. And I've had that interest since uh, even before my undergraduate. But in my undergraduate, I had a little bit of exposure to these and thought that's what I wanted to do and hunted down one of the few graduate places that was offering that kind of work and have really been studying these my entire academic career. And I intend to keep studying them until I figure them out, which will hopefully be sometime in the next two or 300 years. It'll be, it'll be great. Um, I was hired here within this farm comb institute that focuses very much on the gastrointestinal tract. And um, I'm interested in phages, these bacterial viruses, wherever they're found, um, and very much how they shape ecologies. And for me, the gastrointestinal tract is another interesting ecology that we can explore. So I'm certainly, you know, a part of this institute that does a lot of work on the microbiome that is very interested in how this can impact on patients. My perspective is much more, this is an ecology, this is a complex system, that's really informative, that is affecting patients' lives, but I'm really interested in, in, you know, some of the underlying ecology and how we could leverage that. Yeah, a, a, lot, a lot of that aspect, we can make, point to some papers that show some causes of phages with disease or some associations, but we can step back, before, you know, to a much earlier idea, which is essentially that there are a component of this ecosystem, and they're going to play a role. So um, one of the analogies, which is incredibly wrong, but very useful that I tend to use, is to talk about the reintroduction of wolves in, in Yellowstone National Park. So because the wolves had gone extinct in that park, they tried to reintroduce them. And what that did wasn't wipe out all the deer. It was take down the deer population by a little bit. So the average height of the grass got a little bit higher. So the grouse came back and got a slightly higher, larger population. And so essentially, by having the right, in this case, predators, which is an oversimplification, you can keep a system in balance. It can be more robust. It can be more uh, resistant to perturbation. And bacterial viruses, in being predators of bacteria, are shaping this ecology. So anything that you see as a phenotype, when you see that this person has too many of these bacteria or too few of those, could be a failure of that predation or a failure of that biocontrol that was naturally helping keep them in check. Um, this is doubly true because a lot of viruses are not as predatory. They're much more symbiotic and they'll spend more time dormant within their hosts and giving their hosts sort of fitness benefits. So they can stop some species from going extinct that might have otherwise. They can kill off things that are getting too abundant and sort of bring these populations in check. And so I think that's a large portion of, of if you acknowledge that one of the biggest deals that bacteria ever face is bacterial viruses then whenever you see a community in any state, you have to sort of wonder whether it was the fault of the viruses or it's thanks to the viruses that they're in that state. A lot of what we're doing is trying to answer the, the question about what those more symbiotic phages are doing. So while it's a little easier to model the idea of this predator making its way through the population, that can be very helpful, as in the case of the wolves, um, we're much more interested in things that might be interacting with those more dormant phages and might be changing their behavior. So we do know that if you take certain antibiotics, the phages sense this through their bacteria. And it might be the phage that are killing a bunch of different bacteria, not the antibiotics. And so maybe the fact that you feel kind of crappy after taking your antibiotics and people tell you to take a probiotic yogurt or to help your digestion actually isn't so much the direct collateral damage of the antibiotic, it's because it changed the behavior of a whole bunch of these bacterial viruses. So we're very interested in some of the, the signals that the bacterial viruses are sending to make decisions about how they naturally control this kind of um, community. So bacteriophages are absolutely everywhere that bacteria are found. So it's sort of a running comment in our field that if you go looking for a phage in the environment where your bacteria exists and you don't find it, it's your protocol's at fault or your students' fault or you're at fault if you're the one doing it. Um, really, essentially, you take a, a mill of seawater and you have 10 to 100 times as many bacterial viruses as you have bacteria. And you take a gram of feces and you have an excess of bacterial viruses over the bacteria. So basically, if, if you found E. coli in a, from a human gut, somewhere in that patient's gut, you've got plenty of viruses that infect it. And so it makes it fairly easy to go find phages, not always 
the best phages, not always the ones that are usable for things like therapy or your experiments. There's lots of range of it, but it's it's very hard not to find phages. There, there aren't really any environments where we talk about them being absent. So the main one we use is the same one that was used in 1917 when bacterial viruses were first discovered. It's a very simple assay. Um, it's called the plaque assay. And it was good enough for them, and it's good enough for us. Um, we, we, we work on refining it in a couple of different ways, but a lot of this happens based on doing some sort of manipulation and then counting the viruses that come out, how many infectious particles come. And they're really easy to count because the ones that we use kill bacteria. So we give them a big lawn of bacteria, and we dilute out the, the viruses. And then wherever there's a spot where all the bacteria have died, so it's kind of the opposite of a colony. Instead of looking at a place where the bacteria grew, we put the bacteria everywhere and we look at the spots that they didn't grow. And while, you know, just counting phages doesn't sound like it can do you a whole bunch, this is how we discovered that DNA was the genetic material, that recombination happens, you know, the, all the major experiments at the Foundation of Molecular Biology in the 50s, the triplet nature of DNA, of the DNA code, all that stuff was figured out with these black assays. I mean, they're, they're a very robust way to say, okay, well, if we expose this culture that has a sleeping virus in it to this chemical, how many viruses do we get? And if we expose it to a different chemical, do we get more? Is there some interaction between the chemical and the phage? So it's a really simple, it's a fairly cheap technique, and it's old-fashioned, and it's not fancy tools or even microscopes to do it. Uh, it really is the picture you see of the PI staring with his plate up at the light and that you see in every brochure of a, or, or a news article for that. Um, there are lots of other ways in, we can, in which we can track these phages, but because they're invisible and they're, they're smaller than the resolution of light, and so we can't see them with light microscopy, you know, we can look at them with electron microscopes, we can actually get a, a sense of what they look like, but we rarely do those kinds of experiments. Most of what we do is determine how much we've affected them by how well they now kill bacteria and whether they kill different strains than they did before, and so we manipulate the genomes of the bacteria to get more information about that. I mean, we, ha we have microscopes, we do live dead staining, we have 96 well-played assays where we bring this into high throughput, we've got a robot that essentially does um, the plaque assay that I told you about, but miniaturizes it so we can do 1,600 of them at a time instead of doing them one at a time. But at its root, we're still using a 105-year-old technique. It plays a role in, in everything, uh, in that science not communicated is the same as science not done. You know, you could be doing the most brilliant experiments ever if you never tell anybody about them, never publish those findings, never chat about them to someone else who can build on them. There was no point in doing that. It, it was an exercise in intellectual curiosity, self-satisfaction or self-gratification, uh, which is not what science is about. So, you know, when we make these decisions and when we make these discoveries, we have to share them so that other people can be informed by them and so other people can build on them. Um, how it, it's specific to our work, um, you increasingly realize that potential as something that you're doing comes into the public focus. So, you know, people who were working on SARS viruses um, or, or, yeah, you know, things like that probably didn't spend all that much time thinking about how it was going to be perceived by the general public until... I don't know, maybe November of 2019, maybe January 2020, and suddenly they went, ah, hang on, other people are going to have a look at it. You know, when I publish an article about this, I have to be really careful in what I say, that I'm not over-extrapolating, that I'm not suggesting things that scientists might really say is fine, but that the general populace might latch on to and, and go beyond that. And so, in a way, my, my field of bacterial viruses has followed a, a similar sort of trend in that a lot of it was used for purely fundamental discoveries in the 50s uh, and, and a foundation of so much of molecular biology. But increasingly now, there's a focus on how these things could get used for therapy, uh, how they could be used as replacements for antibiotics, how they could be used as adjuvants to antibiotics, how they could be precision therapies to manipulate a microbiome more precisely than antibiotics do um, to get that kind of information. And there are more high-profile cases where people might have read a... Um, an autobiography or a, a, a novelization or something else that involves phage therapy that involves these things. They might come to their doctor or their vet as they do and say, you know, these antibiotics haven't been working. I've heard of this phage thing. 
I've read these papers by all these people. There's this guy at Mac doing face stuff. Surely we can try this on, you know, my grandfather or me or my dog or my horse or whatever it happens to be. So with that comes a responsibility to tamper your claims and know that they might be read by a broader audience and and not get people's hopes up without reason and not overstate your claims in a way that might have just been considered grantsmanship or salesmanship at the level of science that, you know, could really have an impact on people's lives if they read that and think, hang on, this person's going to be able to, you know, save my dog's hearing from this bacterial infection uh, when, you know, that's beyond what I can do right now. So I think I've seen that transition happen and it, it's been driven home because I get these kinds of emails from people who are asking this kind of stuff as well. And so when we're talking science communication, we want to connect with our audience, we want to show how cool this stuff is, but we don't want them to walk away thinking, this is the solution to all of my problems, it's ready, it's a year or two away, or anything like that. So there, there are a lot of apprehensions um, that depend very much on the audience that you speak to. I would say that the anyone who who doesn't know much about it tends not to have a huge amount of apprehension except depending on how it's been pitched if it's we're using viruses to cure you they've probably all seen at least one zombie movie where some scientist said that and then now we've got a zombie apocalypse right and so there might be a little bit hang on wait you're you're using viruses to cure me ah, that doesn't sound like a good idea but in general the the bigger barriers are the people who know a little bit about it and who are quite rightly, and I have these apprehensions as well, knowledgeable about some of the constraints. So one of the biggest constraints is a lot of the associations between the virus and its host are quite tight. So you can easily have a phage that infects one strain of E. coli and no others. We have a phage that we really like that we work with in a lab strain of E. coli. We tested it against 300 other strains of E. coli. It didn't infect a single one. And so that level of specificity is really cool if you want to do an experiment where you're just subtracting that one species or you're taking someone's microbiome and you're saying, we just want to knock out this one species, we don't want to hurt anything else. That's really cool. If your patient comes in with an infection, you can't just give them the phage that you had lying around. You need to know which genus it is, which species it is, and you probably need to know exactly, you need probably need to have tested your phage against the isolate that you got from that patient at that time to make sure that they're compatible and that you have that infection. Take the isolate from the patient, screen it against your library of 10,000 phages and say, we've got these 11 that work really well, we can make some sort of formulation for you. And so that's, that's a, that barrier of specificity is a really challenging one. It's a challenging one from a commercialization standpoint. How do you make money selling this kind of thing when you need to have banks of thousands of thousands to work? Or can you make a a group of 10 or 15 phages that's good for like 60% of cases, and then maybe you get that margin call that, that works out fine. Um, it's a problem because it involves a lot of investment in creating large libraries of phages to do it. And it's a it's always going to be a problem, and this one just isn't surmountable, in that when your patient comes in, you can't just say like, well, they're spiking a fever and they're septic, give them a broad-spectrum phage. That doesn't exist. You can't just give them a broad-spectrum antibiotic in the same way. And so you, there's a time constraint. You need to know more about the disease, about what's causing it, to be able to act upon it. And while there are ways to shorten that time constraint, you're never going to be able to say, the patient came in with a fever, we gave him a broad-spectrum phage. That doesn't, that doesn't exist. People who know even more about it, or who spend a lot of time thinking about antibiotics and drug discovery, uh, might argue, as I do, that the biggest apprehension I have is that antibiotics are so damn good. Um, functionally speaking, they're a miracle drug. It's amazing that, that we can prescribe them, knowing so little about the organism that's causing the infection so quickly, that they're so effective, that their toxicity is remarkably low in humans, that they were fairly cheap to produce, um, that we had this. It's, it's a miracle drug. And so anytime that someone tries to compare phage therapy to it, you know, these are naturally occurring viruses. That's great. Hard to patent, maybe hard to find a way to make money off it, but maybe that's a problem for later. But you're always comparing it against what you have, and it's always going to fall short. It's always going to be clunkier. This is a form of biocontrol. It might be really elegant. It might be really cool to be able to deploy. It might be the only option you have. And when we get to that stage, people will look at it much more closely. But every time someone thinks that it's just a year or two away, 
I point to them that we can't even get new antibiotics on the market because they can't compete with how easy and cheap it is to do the old way. We're not close. To, I mean, we're definitely running out of antibiotics, but people aren't willing to pay $40,000 for the course of antibiotics like they are of chemotherapy. So it's much harder to bring new drugs to market. And you're used to paying eight bucks for your full course of, you know, amoxiclab or whatever it is. And so how do you develop a new technology like phages into a therapeutic space that is always going to be worse than antibiotics, but it's your next line of defense or it's an adjuvant to it or it's helping it. There's a huge financial barrier, which isn't insurmountable. There are ways to get around these financial barriers, but it's made it very hard for people to decide to invest in this for the fundamental research to get done to the same level because they don't see how it can potentially be pushed into something that's profitable until we start to get a catastrophic number of people dying from antibiotic resistant bacteria and people are willing to pay $40,000 for their treatment or whatever it happens to be. So I think one of the, the biggest barriers to why phage therapy research is slow and why their use as therapeutics isn't more widespread is just how good antibiotics are. And that's kind of a I've kind of come full circle on that because I used to think it was a bit of a lazy answer um, to why phage therapy started getting researched early in the last century. And then antibiotics came out and then they sort of stopped getting research for their use as therapeutics. And then there was some molecular biology research done for a while. And, you know, people would say, okay, well, the reason that we don't do phage therapy is because antibiotics were discovered. And like, yeah, but we've known we're running out of antibiotics for 30 years more even. I mean, Alexander Fleming wrote that he was finding penicillin resistant bugs, you know, a few years after he found penicillin. He knew this was happening and, and we've known about it since. So it's not an excuse to when you know you're running out of it that you're not working on the next thing. But really the financial case and what you're competing against, it's really, really hard to justify to someone this is where you should put resources to create this thing that doesn't exist yet that has to compete with one of the most efficient things that we've ever had at our disposal for saving lives. And uh, so, yeah, if any comparison you make between phages and antibiotics, the, the phages are going to fall short. They're more specific. They're clunkier. They have slower shelf lives. They're harder to produce uh, to some extent. Depends on the phages. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's really easy to come up with a list of 50 ways in which they're worse than antibiotics. It's very easy to come up with a reason, one way in which they're better than dying, um, but, you know, we're not there for enough people and enough pressure to really justify saying, let's look at this slightly clunkier system that we don't control as tightly because it's a biological system. So. Yeah, so it's not even a question of is there a risk. This absolutely happens. It happens in real time in the lab. Um, I can take a strain of bacteria in the lab, throw a phage at it, and uh, with one strain that we have there, but one in a million bacteria will survive, which, you know, in this case, is probably enough for your immune system to clear the infection. It's great. You killed 99.9999% of it. It's great. Um, that's really effective. But I can do this challenge on the first day, then take one of those resistant bugs and challenge them with phage, and there'll be a phage somewhere in there that was already a mutant that's able to get through that. And then I can get a phage that infects the mutant line. And then I can take that mutant line and that mutant bacteria, combine them, they'll kill 99.999% of one. You can do this every day. I could essentially get a new phage that's, that'll infect this new bacterium. And you can continue this arms race until, you know, eternity, because it's been happening since anything that could be called a phage or anything that could be called a bacterium has existed. So in one sense, it's really, um, it's, it's far more relevant in the constant context of antibiotics where finding a new antibiotic is hard. Finding a new phage is easy. Making sure that you already have it ready if it, the treatment is failing, that might be a little harder. You already need these biobanks for these pre-prep things. Um, but also just evolving your phage to be better at infecting this new one is also not all that tricky and is something that you can do in real time. Does that in and of itself have some drawbacks? I mean, people are nervous about the ability to patent evolving systems, uh, about whether you have to recertify or repatent anything that you've done now that you've evolved it to go against that same, uh, this, this newly resistant bug. Uh, and this is also, if, even if you do this kind of iterative thing, it's expensive. Expensive in the fact that it takes a few days and it takes an, in someone to do it individually for that patient. Um, so you hear about phase therapy cases where this, this has worked and been put in, into practice in really exciting ways. Um, one of the most famous is uh, at uh, UC San Diego, 
there was um, Stephanie Strathdee and her husband, Tom, and he had this infection that was not treatable in any other way. And she went and heard about phase therapy and contacted some people. And they found a cocktail of three phages that would work against this bug. They tested it. It worked in a test tube. So they administered it. And then it was starting to really work. And then when they tested it, they found out that the bug had become resistant to this cocktail. But then what they did was they went to a bunch of sewage water from a whole bunch of places nearby, filtered it, and tested it on this new bug, and found another phage that they were able to administer. So it's a success story in that they were able to iterate on this kind of treatment. But from the standpoint of apprehension, that's basically personalized medicine, right? That's a, that's a team of doctors or, or technicians or researchers, you know, working with this one patient, monitoring that patient's status, using information from that patient to go find new drugs personalized to that patient and administering them. That is always going to be, again, more expensive than antibiotics. It's always going to be clunkier. It's always going to be trickier. So apprehension-wise, I mean, that's a huge investment in costs and resources and time uh, of, of you know, professionals and, and uh, highly trained individuals to try and deliver that level of care. And as a case study, it's phenomenal. It's really exciting as something that really can be ported out and become widely used, that's a significant barrier. I used to say it a lot more in the way um, that you will find that any of these companies that's trying to work towards a phage solution, they tend to work with the word phage and not the word virus. They tend to say, you know, phages do this and they infect bacteria and they and it's specific to bacteria. To some extent, I think that's become a little less necessary than it used to be. I, you know, I think there was that con connotation of, yeah, some zombie movie where someone was trying to cure cancer with a virus and now everybody's a zombie. Um, I think there's a lot more contexts in which people have used viruses as vectors for vaccines as, as to produce these things to, um, you know, that hasn't always had a great PR campaign, but has worked by and large in, in a lot of countries. Uh, in treatments for therapies, in the idea of oncolytic viruses that have sort of laid down a bit more of a foundation. That's, you know, maybe most people don't know about oncolytic viruses, but the sales pitch for them hasn't been that hard. So I don't think it's a massive issue from that point. There is the, the biocontainment aspect is one that when I first heard that question a few years ago, it kind of caught me off guard because I'd, I'd never really thought of it. You're giving this patient phages, what's going to happen to them? And the answer is, well, the, some of them are going to get pooped out and some of them are going to get peed out and some of them are going to get spat out probably you know they're circulating in your body and they're doing that all the time and there's plenty of viruses already there within you so you're adding some in and they're going to get back into the environment is that a concern i mean generally speaking i'd be like well they were already all there and they do nothing unless they find the specific host that they want so is it going to do anything only if it sees the strain of pseudomonas that you were training it on it's a really narrow constrained effect but from the standpoint of biocontainment People are right in saying that you're giving someone something live and replicating and you then don't have control over it, right? And so it will get out into the environment where the only thing that we know that it can do is acting on the bugs that we have specifically tested it against. So I don't see ways in which it has large collateral damage, but it's not a very tightly closed system in which you can say, you know, nothing gets out of this. Um, I mean, some things that you can use that I tend to is to highlight um, some of these case studies and these books. So there's, you know, The Perfect Predator, but there's even books going back to early 1920s, a Pulitzer Prize winning book called uh, um, Aerosmith that shows that this idea has been in the public consciousness for over 100 years now. This idea, that, I mean, at the time it was a science fiction novel, but it was about essentially some doctor curing plague or cholera on some Mediterranean islands using phages, right? This idea has been around for a hundred years. It's had quite a few stumbling blocks. It has quite a few challenges and antibiotics themselves have quite a few challenges. He, you can tell that story. You can say like, these are great viruses. They're naturally compatible with these. They do replicate at the site of infection. It's what they do in nature. We can, we can employ biocontrol. But you have to give the counterpoint. You have to say, look, the it's it's not that scientists like me really do believe that this will work, but that the case for it being widely adopted just isn't there now. Um, that that we need, things need to get worse before they get better. 
and that there isn't enough pressure to develop things as clunky as these compared to antibiotics. And so it's not an easy solution. It's not a cheap solution. Uh, and while we're doing more and more of the work to build the clinical trials to really show that this can work, even then it's going to be a struggle to get it widely adopted because it is clunky. Um, and there are ways in which you can illustrate that. And I've tried to use a few of them to show that personalized medicine is expensive, um, to highlight some of the clinical trials that have failed um, for silly reasons, you know, bad design or other things that just didn't understand some of the, the core components. Um, you don't want to overpromise, but you want to get people to, to be excited about this idea. And I think the getting them excited about the idea is easy. The idea that the, you could, you know, 105 years ago, someone was able to do an experiment that showed something killed bacteria, and it was the first clear sign that you had something to kill bacteria with. And he immediately thought, we could, we, if we can kill bacteria like this, we can cure people. That's a really powerful idea. It was a really powerful idea 105 years ago. But we haven't really implemented it wildly because it's a hard idea to implement. It's a really elegant concept, a really simple concept, but it's very challenging to do logistically. And so it requires a lot of work. And so the places to look at are the places that are doing that work and see why are they only doing case studies? Why is this one-on-one, -on -one, right? It's really hard to design a clinical trial for something as personalized and individualized as it. So if you point them to Belgium and the Royal Astrid Hotel, military uh, hospital, sorry, not hotel, that's running a whole bunch of phage-related stuff, it's always on a case-by-case -case basis right now. It's a great proof of concept, but we still haven't seen a good clinical trial, right? And you, we need that kind of information. Um, when you point to the, the center at UCSD uh, in San Diego that has done this, again, it's been on these individual cases. So you can t point to lots of fun success stories, but you've got to warn them that these are individual cherry-picked success stories, that to get to the broader thing, there's a lot of barriers in the way. Um, and I, I think that one of the most clear ways of putting that is by contrasting it with antibiotics and, and by showing how hard it has been to get new antibiotics to market when antibiotics are just easier and better than phages. And even then, companies that bring new antibiotics to market go bankrupt because they can't compete against an $8 drug that's already doing the work for 99.9% .9 of the people. It's not until it's only working in a third of people that you know people are going to be willing to pay more to justify the R&D costs for something as awesome as antibiotics. And it's going to get worse than that before people are going to be willing to to invest in, and to build in these more cumbersome structures that are needed for phages. Absolutely. So phages get used as delivery vectors. Um, you can create, you can use them to, to because of their specificity to bacteria, you can use them by coating them with things to know that they'll then get close to the bacteria and stick to them to essentially bring local concentrations of some antibiotic up next to these, even without relying on the bactericidal effects of the phage, or even you can make dummy particles that don't have DNA to inject anymore. They're just the spidery thing that you imagine when you think of a phage. They'll still bind to cells, so they'll still bring things there. They could bring immune cells, they could be immunogenic, they could do these kinds of things. So they, they do get used for that. They get used in nanoconstructions. Um, there are phages that are basically really tightly wind bundles, so you can coat them with all sorts of things and make nanofilaments in ways that you can't do with any kind of precision in any other way. And as experimental tools for studying biology, they're still the best out there. If you are trying to determine things about life in general and you're studying eight elephants in the Sahara, you're going to have a very, not in the Sahara, that would be a terrible example, but it, you know, you're, you're following these long-lived organisms with slow generation times. You're never going to get any conclusions about life in, in, in a broader sense. It's why people work with bacteria, because they double quickly, because they're haploid, because any changes to their genotype are more likely to manifest in their phenotype, because you can manipulate them, because you're allowed to kill billions of them without feeling guilty. All of these things help. They make your experiments faster. They allow you to explore things like evolution. Phages are even faster. They're faster than the bacteria that they infect. They've got smaller, more compressed genomes. They're more elegant machines. So when you're asking questions about, you know, replicative biology as a whole, the place to get the answers the fastest, the cleanest, and the coolest really are the phages. And I mean, that's what drew me to them in the first place and is still the reason why I like it. Partly, I'm an impatient scientist. I like to set up an experiment and have my answer, you know, later that day or the next day. I, I don't really want to follow, follow a cohort for 20 years to find out if my, my gut instinct was wrong, uh, which it usually is. 
And I'm really glad that there are people doing the hard research in humans and in higher animals that I could never do because I just don't feel like you get a really convincing answer quickly out of it. Um, but I'm really happy to be able to play with something as easy to work with as phages are. Well, they take all the courses that I happen to teach as obviously they're easy. No, um, I mean, some of my, a lot of people have been, have come to me after watching a YouTube video that talks about phage therapy, like a Kultzkasakt video or something else like that. Um, and these are well-researched and they tell a, tell a good story and it sparks that interest and then they want to know more. And so those, and those have been great educational tools and they keep coming up and they, they clearly have a nice broad reach and they don't say anything that's incorrect and, and so they're, they're a really good starting point from that. Uh, I mean, if you have a little bit of a more of an interest in, in them from a biology standpoint, one of my absolute favorite books that I would recommend is called Thinking Like a Phage. It's a story of uh, some of the cool ways in which phage interact with bacteria, not just how they kill them, but yeah, how they get onto them, how they inject, sort of told through the lens of three or four different families of phages with cute nicknames throughout the book. And it's fairly approachable, not necessarily to a lay audience, but to someone within a program that is some idea of what viruses are supposed to be trying to do if we can attribute agency, um, that is kind of quirky and fun and a neat approach to some of the ways these machines can work that I quite enjoy. Um, it's an expensive book to get, though. Um, there's also some other similar books, but if they're really interested in it from a phage therapy standpoint, the the book um, The Perfect Predator by Stephanie Strathy has been very popular and, I, again, is another place where lots of people have come to me saying, you know, I read this book and now I want to work in your lab. So thank you, Stephanie Strathy, for that. I have thanked her in person for that. But it's a good opener. It's a good uh, introduction to what kind of potential this can have. Um, and then I can, you know, come in and bring a few more of the caveats and say, like, this is why I think we're still a long ways away from this being widely adopted, you know, and across the world in contexts that don't have access to the same amount of resources and, and you know, uh, as, as this particular case. But I think it's, you know, it's a good starting point and it's a fun starting point. So the ways in which people have come to me have been good. You know, there haven't really been people who came to me because they read this scientific paper that's a load of jargon and that is terrible. It really is. It's Kroskasag videos or reading this book or having heard about it through one of these ways. And so I'm, I'm happy with how people are being exposed to it. And it generally doesn't come with this idea of being afraid of viruses or, you know, that maybe would have uh, dominated the conversation earlier.